Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Professor uh, Dogra for giving me this opportunity. So I will be discussing on the management of uh, joint retinal tears and uh, RDs associated with choroidal detachments. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'll start with the definition. First part will focus on the joint retinal tears, on its definition, etiology, and the management steps. So a uh, joint retinal tear is a full thickness neurosensory retinal break that extends circumferentially around the retina for three or more clock hours, that is 90 degrees or more. They are not very common. They account for 0.5 to 8.3% of all the cases of uh, regmatogenous retinal detachments, and around 12.8% of these cases are bilateral. The most common location is just po posterior to the ora serrata in 82% cases. They may be equatorial in another 15%, and posterior to the equator, like we see here, are uh, less common, are around 3%. Uh, etiology, uh, a large number of them can be simply idiopathic, 55%. This is followed by trauma in 4 to 31% cases. Hereditary vitreo retinopathies contribute to 14.5% of GRTs. Then myopia, bifthalmos, and also we may have some of them which are iatrogenic. The fellow eye. About, as I mentioned, around 12.8% of the patients have bilateral joint retinal tears. Therefore, it is important to watch and manage the other eye to prevent these cases. The most common predisposing retinal lesion reported in the fellow eye of patients with giant retinal tears is white without pressure areas, which are anterior to the equator and parallel to the ora serrata. Additionally, there may be presence of lattice with or without retinal breaks and chororetinal atrophic areas. Over time, uh, th it these have uh, those, uh, as reported by Freeman et al., what changes occur? So white without, without pressures coalesce. They develop progressive vitreous condensation, which is clinically appearing as a frosted appearance. In management, pass plana vitrectomy in the today's era with either a 23 or 25 gauge is the preferred treatment modality for a giant retinal tear, especially those with inverted flaps. In case there are no inverted flaps and uh, the PVR is not much, there may be that s some of them may work with the primary buckle alone. But once you have an inverted flap, we have to go in and do a pass planar vitrectomy. There are certain additional procedures or adjuvants we require which are specific to the case. And there are some questions which come along. For example, whether or not a supplementary scleral buckle is required, the use of triamcinolone, the use of PFCL in today's era is inevitable. And then the use of chandelier illumination, and then silicon oil and its injection system. The first question, to apply a supplementary buckle or not. The argument for applying a buckle is that giant tears occur in patients with an abnormal vitreous base. And to support this region may prevent tractional forces that may result in reopening of the tear. In faking patients, the crystalline lens may hinder peripheral base, base dissection, so adding a supplementary buckle will help. And also it will help in cases with PVR. The arguments against applying a supplementary buckle is that you generally tend to cut off the anterior flap, so that, that means that you have released the vitreous traction there, so there is no vitreous traction, but the edges of the tear and the remaining retina is what contributes to it. And then the major risk uh, is the risk of slippage of the posterior flap. And there, uh, there is obviously a questionable role in giant tears which are more than 180 deg uh, degrees extent, and there is no role in applying if you have a 360 degrees giant retinal tear. So when do you do it? If uh, giant, uh, the tear extends to less than 180 degrees, inferior in location, associated with anterior PVR, and or there are additional lesions in the periphery which predispose to additional breaks, and in phakic patients where you may be not satisfied with the peripheral uh, vitreous base dissection. The key to applying is that you apply, you do not put indent high, you apply a low-lying buckle. That will prevent the slippage of the posterior flap. The second, uh, the second important maneuver that we have to do while doing a vitrectomy is to reposition the flap of the giant tear. We have moved on from the era where sometimes the, the surgery used to be done in a prone position to invert that flap because of the use of the PFCL. The PFCL has really come to our help. It is a high specific gravity f uh, liquid lower viscosity that allows easy injection and removal through smaller gauge instruments. The tamponading force uh, of PFCL is more than three times that of silicon oil, thus affording greater mechanical stability to the retina during membrane peeling and vitreous-based dissection. 
but we also have to remember that it has lower surface tension compared to air or gas so care should be taken to ensure that it does not migrate subretinally because that is what can happen and then there is also an incidence of uh, fish eggs because the the pfcl bubble breaking into multiple small bubbles for that the bubble the pfcl bubble should be injected slowly and it should remain posterior to the infusion line so this is the uh, two small videos i will show so we be begin with a 360 degrees peritomy once we are planning to add on a supplementary buckle as you just saw that this is a fake hic patient this is followed by riddling all the recti and generally we don't we use only a 240 band we don't use a tire in these patients after this uh, the standard sclerotomy ports are made at standard distance distances from the limbus uh, in most of the cases, generally, we are now using a 25-gauge uh, uh, instrumentation because now they have become stiffer and they are easier to manipulate. And now we have also very high cut rates from 7,500 to now. The 10,000 cut, uh, cut rate cutter is also available. So first, after do making the sclerotomy ports, you do a start with a core vitrectomy. This should be done at high cut rates and uh, little lower aspiration rates because the edge of the GRT is very mobile, it can come into the cutter. So most of the times in cases such as this, the idiopathic ones, you have a already have a pre-existing posterior vitreous detachment. So uh, the anterior, the core vitrectomy is done. This is followed by the injection of the PFCL. Now this is an important step. When you are injecting PFCL, start over the disc, you have to and then the, the tip of the uh, injector has to, be has to lie within the PFCL bubble. And then the injection has to be slow. So this will prevent formation of the, of the PFCL bubbles. And then you have to take care that you remain posterior to the flap. Because sometimes this PFCL, if you are injecting fast, it will come into the subretinal space and break down into multiple bubbles. So slow injection of the PFCL with the tip uh, continuously within the bubble will prevent this and you go all the way till you reach the anterior, fla uh, anterior flap. Also, once we begin, this will act as a third hand, it will stabilize it so you can complete the peripheral vitreous dissection, trim the anterior flap of the giant retinal tear. After this, you follow it up with endolaser, endol uh, endolaser and then, then comes the next step. The question is whether you will do a PFCL oil exchange direct, which is the most common trend, or you'll do a PFCL air exchange. So the most commonly people will do a direct PFCL uh, and or silicon oil exchange in the at this situation. But here I will show a technique which I have learned from Professor Dogra is what you do a PFCL air exchange. So once you begin, because this there is a trick to doing a PFCL air exchange, once you're doing the PFCL air exchange, your soft tip or the extrusion cannula should be remain at the uh, this the the posterior flap the anterior margin of the posterior flap so first you have to dry that anterior flap only then we go posteriorly only then you will be able to prevent the slippage Be if this step is not done sure and short there will be a chance that the that the retina will step pos posteriorly after this it can be simply followed with a simple oil exchange that is done if you are doing a PFCL oil exchange directly then at this point, this is a, uh, following an air exchange, but if you're doing a direct exchange, then again, there are two methods. Uh, either you substitute the infusion line with the silicon oil injection system and use your two hands to do that. Uh, in this case, the assistant will have to hold that oil syringe while you are injecting. Or you can uh, insert a chandelier here, and then uh, that can provide the illumination, and, use and then, then your two hands are free to do that. This is another uh, video which I will show. This was a post-traumatic uh, giant retinal tear in a young male uh, who presented with history of trauma with a ball. He's a fake patient, young patient. Uh, in this, once we have applied the supplementary buckle, we start with the vitrectomy. Like I mentioned that uh, typically the definition of giant tear means that there is a pre presence of a posterior vitreous detachment. But in these cases, the, the vitreous may not have detached. So it is very important to inject the triamcinolone and induce a, a posterior vitreous detachment if to and to see that if it is not present to induce a posterior vitreous detachment. 
after you have uh, induced the PVD, yes. So after you have induced the PVD, especially in cases which are very posterior, because you have a large anterior flap, you cannot go all the way and trim the whole of the anterior flap. So you have to be very carefully go and dissect out vitreous by the shave mode of the cutter, and uh, and it is particular and particular interest has to be given to the edges of the giant pier. So make sure that you trim the vitreous of the edges of the giant pier here on both sides. In this situation, once you inject the PFCL, just keep it posterior to the posterior flap because that will act as a third hand and it will facilitate the peripheral base dissection. After this, the standard steps are completed like I, I had shown in the uh, previous surgery. For want of time, I'll just skip this video. And then the uh, retinopexy. And another question is whether you'll do a 360 degree laser or you'll just laser the giant tear. So there is wide variation in the extent of application of laser. So there are no randomized trials, but the anatomic reattachment rates reported to be higher with a 360 degree laser compared to eyes with laser alone to the giant tear. So PFCL oil exchange, the advantage, it, it reduces the chance of retinal slippage, but it has a learning curve. So avoid filling PFCL up to the infusion line to avoid smaller PFCL bubbles falling, and it can be done by manual or with the help of an assistant. Silicon oil versus gas. Can you ever use gas? The answer is yes, it can be used, though the uh, uh, reported anatomic success rates are much higher with silicon oil. But there is only one randomized control study published by Batman et al. in 1999, where they compared 47 eyes with giant uh, tears receiving either C3F8 or silicon oil, and they found no significant difference between the two groups. So these are the, the same two patients I have shown. The intraoperative complications can be extension of the tear during vitrectomy, tear slippage, retinal folds, persistent rolled retinal edges, subretinal PFCL, PFCL fish eggs, raised intraocular pressure du during the PFCL silicon oil exchange. And the postoperative complications could be residual PFCL, it may lead to photoreceptor toxicity under the fovea and corneal decompensation if it remains too long in the anterior segment, progression of cataract, recurrent detachments with PVR. And the causes could include anterior traction, reproliferation at the edges of the tear, mixed missed breaks, presence of concomitant macular holes, and the occurrence of PVR. So the pearls are that trimming the edges of the tear well, identifying all the distant breaks, injecting PFCL slowly as a single bubble, removing all anterior fluid by driving, drying the edges of the giant tear thoroughly to prevent slippage. PFCL air or PFCL oil exchange works. Both can work but they have learning curves to them and a long-term tamponade ne is needed whether you do silicon oil or maybe 